Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Three Cosmic Messages. And those of you who have been Seventh-day Adventists for many years will probably recognize almost immediately we're talking about the Three Angels messages. And this is lesson number nine in that series from May 27 of 2023, entitled a city called confusion. You might be able to guess who that is talking about. Let's find out after we have our word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come again to try to discover uh, what the Bible can teach us about these critical issues that face us as we approach the end of time. May we see and discuss them clearly as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Throughout the Bible, religious groups are represented by women. A pure woman dressed in white represents a true and faithful church. A false woman is presented or represented as dressed in scarlet or purple with all sorts of gaudy makeup and jewelry. The true woman is faithful to her Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The false woman is turned from Jesus Christ to follow human leadership. So there's a critical difference are we following Jesus Christ or are we following human leadership? Back in the Old Testament in the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 20, God is discussing with Hosea about his wife and what should happen. What did he say, Gordon? I mean, Jim, I'm sorry. I will keep my promise and make you mine, and you will acknowledge me as Lord, from the American Bible Society. Okay. So, critical issue is, you will acknowledge me as Lord. Ezekiel wept because, quote, you are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. That's a, not a very good thing, is it? Even in the New Testament, James wrote, Gordon? James 4.4, 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. New King James Version. Have you, any of you, been in church and had the pastor stand up and say, adulterers and adulteresses? Not lately. <laughs> Not lately, okay. For many years, Seventh-day Adventists memorized Revelation 12, 17. I'm sure every one of us here in this group have memorized it at some point where we were told, and I'm looking at two different versions of that. Myra? Uh, okay, from the Good News Bible, it says, the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. All those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. And then from the New King James Version, the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Obviously, Satan is very upset because the gospel is spreading all over the world. However, we know what the final outcome will be. Revelation 17, 14 says clearly, they will fight against the Lamb, but the Lamb together with his called, chosen, and faithful followers will defeat them. And how are the faithful going to defeat them? because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Well, that's not too hard to understand. So we they know, won't defeat him with, with uh, force. Source and tanks and airplanes and swords and spears. Not even atom bombs. Not even atom bombs. We know that the Lord has always had at least a few faithful people. They have often been referred to as my people or the remnant. But Satan is not asleep. He's anxious to destroy as many of God's faithful people as he can. Jim? Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. Okay, so that's what Satan wants, wants everybody to do, drink his strange wine. But what's going to happen? Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come, and I will show you how the famous prostitute is to be punished, that great city 
that is built many year, excuse me, that is built near many rivers. The king of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the people of the world again drunk from drunk from drinking the wine of her immorality. Oh boy. So what we have is is an example of uh, what adultery is. It's yeah. Have, inter, intercourse with uh, foreign gods, mm -hmm. foreign de deities. So why is John even talking about Babylon? He wrote his book in Re of Revelation from the Isle of Patmos near the end of the first century AD. At that time, the city of Babylon was nothing but a pile of rubble. Babylon was destroyed completely by the Medes and Persians in 539 BC. And John's prophecies as written in the book of Revelation, there is presented a false religious system that will have similar characteristics to Babylon of the Old Testament. So then that means that we need to try to determine what were, what were the characteristics of the ancient Babylon and then see if we can find a modern counterpart that has some of those same characteristics. So what are those characteristics? Continuing down from Revelation 17, three through six, Gordon. The spirit took, took control of me and the angel carried me to a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a red beast that had names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and covered with gold ornaments, precious stones and pearls. In her hand, she held a gold cup full of obscene and filthy things, the result of her immorality. On her forehead was written a name that had a secret meaning, Great Babylon, the mother of all the prostitutes and perverts in the world. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they had been loyal to Jesus. When I saw her, I was completely amazed. Good News Bible. Important to recognize who this woman was and what beast it is that she's riding upon. This is something that no one ever told me when I was young. I studied these things. I thought I knew this stuff. Nobody ever said this to me. Revelation 12, 13 and 14. Myra, I think that's yours. Hi. Oh, it is mine, sorry. Revelation 12, 13 and 14. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to earth, he began to pursue the woman who had given birth to the boy. She was given two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the desert where she, was, she will be taken care of for three and a half years, safe from the dragon's, dragon's attack. New uh, Good News Bible. Now we all know who that woman was, right? Symbolically, that's the church, because it was Mary who gave birth to Jesus Christ, and the dragon, who was doing everything he could to destroy Jesus? The devil. The devil. The devil. The devil. Okay, so let's see if we can nail this down further. Revelation 12, 3 and 4, another mysterious, mysterious sight in the sky. There was a huge red dragon. Now notice, what, what do we know about this dragon? It's red, with seven heads and ten horns. That's the same. And a crown on each of his heads. With his tail, he dragged a third of the angels out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. He stood in front of the woman in order to eat her child as soon as it was born. So there we have the overlapping, trying to destroying the child. So who's the dragon that dragged angels out of heaven? Well, that would be Satan. Lucifer. Has to be Satan, doesn't it? Well, Revelation 12, 3 and 4 tells us that the red dragon is the devil himself. Revelation 12, 13 and 14 tells us that the woman who had given birth to the child escaped to the desert running from the dragon. And in case you have any questions about who the dragon was, Revelation 12, 7 and 9 makes it very clear. We're not going to bother to go there right now. Revelation 17, 3 through 6 tells us that the pure woman who had escaped to the desert has now become the scarlet woman sitting on the red beast the devil himself, and by that time was doing all sorts of obscene and immoral things. This is the story of the nominal Christian church or churches as it has been deceived by the devil. From the time of the original disciples following Jesus very carefully to the present time, what's happened to the church? The, the, the whole Christian church, counting all of us together? has it's moved its way to the devil's side. What do you and mean by the nominal Christian church? 
well, in, in name, they're Christians. All who call themselves Christians. That's what well, they're yeah, not. Yeah, but right now I think it's 45,000 Christian denominations around the world. So which one has the right message? Well, I mean, the, the question is which one's doing this? Which one's deceived? They're yeah. maybe all deceived. Well, we're going to talk about the issues here. So let's, Christians must be fully prepared for Satan's final desperate onslaught. And how do we prepare ourselves? Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. Finally, build up your strength in union with the Lord and by means of his mighty power. Put on all the armor that God gives you so that you will be able to stand up against the devil's evil tricks. For we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. So stand ready with truth as a belt tight round your waist, with righteousness as your breastplate, and as your shoes, the readiness to announce the God good news of peace. At all times carry faith as a shield, for with it you will be able to put out all the burning arrows shot by the evil one, and accept salvation as a helmet and the word of God as a sword which the Spirit gives you. Okay, so Jim, your question, who is it? It's the people who've done all those things. So how effective will Satan be in spreading his message to the world? And what kind of help does he get in doing that? Jim, again. Well, Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 and 4 and 7 and 8. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have falsely have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshiped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast also saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? Okay, now let me interrupt for a second. How many people are worshiping the dragon? Says everyone. Okay, and who is the dragon? The devil. The devil. The devil himself. How many people today, anywhere around the world, are literally worshiping the devil? A lot of, there are a fair number that claim to, but maybe most actually do. Okay, you want to read on? It, that is the beast, was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe and nation, language and race. All people living on the earth will worship it, except yeah. those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living which belongs to the lamb that was killed. Is there any way to find out if your name is in that book? Well, it was, it was written in there before, before the creation of the world. So I God in his foreknowledge, that's a, a foreknowledge problem. What do they do with the process theologian piece, yeah, people? Yeah, this is a tremendous word, I mean, a ver verse for the foreknowledge of God. How many people have gone to University of Chicago or Claremont and, yeah. and come out with a process theology and, and they get a, a teaching position here at the university? Well, notice it says all people living on earth will worship it. So before we had everyone, now we have all people on the earth. There's How many did that leave out? Huh? It was, it was left out of that. That's except, except. It says, except okay. those. It sounds like Satan is winning, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, uh, look at Reformation. These folks stood up for their conviction and they studied the scriptures. Yes. They knew the stuff. But mm -hmm. the devil came up with uh, some, they came up with uh, just with uh, order, for example. Their sole purpose is to destroy mm -hmm. the church. <coughs> well, what they do and is what they've done, you know. They're bearing false witness <laughs> to the truth about God, right? Yeah. And guess who started that? <laughs> we don't even know how far back it was. We know <laughs> we don't God, have a calendar. God will have his faithful remnant. Amen. We are in the midst of the great controversy. Both sides are fighting hard to promote their messages. Let's be very clear about that. Well, you use the right, I think, the right word, and that is remnant. And a remnant doesn't mean like a, bare, a high percentage. Yeah. Okay, Charles. It's Revelation 14, 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the, in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. There we have it again, all those different groups, don't we? Yes. Okay. Revelation chapter 17, verse 2. 
The kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the people of the world became drunk from drinking the wine of her immorality. Okay, we're talking about a lot of things that wouldn't be obvious. The meaning wouldn't be obvious to a person just reading this for the first time. A lot of symbols. A lot of symbols. So let's see if we can unpack some of them. Sexual immorality in a spiritual sense, sometimes called fornication, is an illicit union, right? Wrong people are missing. I remember uh, Dr. Provanti used to say, sexual immorality is not just the wrong skin touching the wrong skin. There's more to it than that. Okay, so from Bible Study Guide, Gordon? For Monday, it is the fallen church system uniting with the state. It is the true, in, in, in the true uh, church system, the church is united with Jesus Christ. The fallen church looks to the political leaders of the earth for power and authority. It seeks the state to enforce the de its decrees. Rather than drawing her strength from Jesus as her true head, she looks to the state for support. Okay, so now we've seen another very clear distinction between the good and the bad. The true church is following who? Christ. And accepting teachings from? Jesus Christ, okay? And the false church is doing what? Or all the other rest of them, everybody else is accepting Looking human Christ. authority. Yeah. Human authority. Whether it's the government or another church. Exactly. Just as we have two kinds of women, representing two kinds of churches, the pure woman dressed in white and the scarlet dressed woman representing the rebel rebellion against God, we have two kinds of wine. One, the pure juice of the grape, representing the blood and teachings of Jesus Christ, and two, the corrupt wine, representing the teachings of the church that has murdered Christians consistently down through the generations. Now that gives us some clues, doesn't it? How does the Bible describe this corrupt religion? Myra? Well, in Matthew 15, 9, it says, It is no use for them to worship me because they teach human rules as though they were my laws. So that's re reinforcing yeah. what we read up here. Right. The question is, are we following human teachings or are we following God's teachings? Well, that's thing, that comes from way back in the Old Testament. Yeah. Isaiah 29, 13 says, The Lord says, these people claim to worship me, but their words are meaningless. Their hearts are somewhere else. Their religion is nothing but human rules and traditions, which they have simply memorized. And it blows me away every time I think about this, but there's pretty good evidence that people in Bible times, the, 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 the priests and so forth, memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew memorized the entire whole Old Testament in Hebrew. Just, hmm. Oh, they were doing it even in yeah. recent past. Yeah. Perhaps doing it even now. Yeah, some, yeah. some, there's some, uh, I know personally someone who went to, went into a class with a lot of Hebrew students, they had memorized entire books of the Old Testament. Yeah, I had a classmate and uh, Steve Grossman, he memorized the Pentateuch. He had to as a child. Really? Yeah, he used mm. to tell me. Not in Hebrew, though. Yeah, but, well, he, uh, that part I do not know. Maybe, maybe not. But, you know... I, well, I, but I mean, it's, understand, this, the yeah. ancient people, Hebrew was their language. That's so. right, but they had to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, all, every, all yeah. the kids. And this we're talking about 40 years ago mm -hmm. that they were doing this in New York. As we have seen, now let's nail this down, Satan is determined to control the entire world. Satan wants to get rid of all God's people to destroy them, and then he wants to claim before the entire onlooking universe, this globe, this world is mine. All the people here are mine, so just leave us alone. This is our place. Well, even some of God's faithful people will be swept up in his corrupt system. God calls them to come out of that corrupt system. Revelation 18, two through four says, he cried out, this is one of those uh, angels that, that made the, made the they talked about the seven last, the seven plagues. He cried out in a loud voice, she has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. For all the nations have drunk her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. 
the kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the world grew rich from her unrestrained lust. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out, my people, come out from her. You must not partake of her sins. You must not share in her punishment. Now notice God says, Come out, my people. What does that mean? He hasn't abandoned them. There's, still God has still has, there. he still has faithful people in, in those corrupt churches. They're do, they just haven't found out the truth yet. Remember what John wrote as a dis description of this corrupt woman? See John 17, 46, as we just read. But reading on, uh, Jim? In order to search and for an understanding of the nature of Babylon, we need to go back to its first reference in the biblical record in Genesis. It all began with the plain of the land of Shinar, a re region in the south excuse me, in the southern part of Mesopotamia, today southern Iraq, called Babylonia. It is there that the Tower of Babel was built, a symbol of human self-sufficiency, self-preservation, and independence from God. This is from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Okay, so Genesis 11, we know what happened. Well, as soon as the floodwaters were down and they started putting together their own society, what were they trying to do? Escape from God's escape. next flood. Direct in defiance of what God had told them. He told them, scatter over the earth. We don't want to scatter over the earth. We're going to build our own tower and we're going to survive if there's another flood. And these are Noah's descendants. These are Noah's descendants, that's correct. Remember that back in Genesis 11, they built the Tower of Babel in direct defiance of God. As a result, God confused their languages and scattered them out over the earth, which is exactly what they didn't want to do. Later in the Hebrew language, Babel came to mean mixed up or confused. However, in the ancient Babylonian language, Babel meant gateway to the gods. Isn't that something? What a change. Are we ever tempted to believe that we have the truth? Be careful. And Absolutely. The, the, the question is really, does the truth, truth have us? Yeah, the real question should be, does the truth have us? Isn't that what we're taught all through? Sure. You know, the we have the truth. Well, we're so, this is so important. I am the way, the mm -hmm. truth, the life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so very important for us. Well, it's so often, it, it, it's so, so scary for us to think, okay, we've got the truth. We don't need any more help. We don't need even Jesus. We're, no, no. We've got that, the that's truth. That's a perfect way to arrogance, yes. spiritual arrogance. Yeah. It's important. You're on the Adventist bus. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But, but it's not just Adventists that think they have the no. truth. Oh, no, Everyone, Everyone thinks they have the truth. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in that church. If this, they, is a, if they, this is an if epidemic. If they're being honest, they, they would have to, have to abandon that church if they thought it was wrong. And if you had the truth, why would you look around for something else? Yeah. This is not just an epidemic, it's a pandemic. So in the midst of this great conflict between God and Satan, what is the role of those of us who claim to be on God's side at this point in history? Make no mistake. This is a life and death struggle for Satan and for God's faithful people. However, we know what the result will be at the end. Matthew 16, 18. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock. And on this rock foundation, I will build my church and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. They will fight against the Lamb, but the Lamb, together with, the, uh, together with uh, His yes. called, chosen, and faithful followers, will defeat them because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Okay, we've looked at that verse twice, and it's a good, it's a very reassuring thing because we want to believe that God is going to be victorious, don't we? Thus we can say that any system that promotes human ideas and places them above the Word of God in importance is adopting a Babylonian system. Notice these words. This is from the Bible Study Guide for Wednesday. In the last days of Earth's history, a church-state system will arise, spiritual Babylon, 
with a spiritual leader claiming to speak as God. Hmm. I wonder who does that. His word will be declared to be the very word of God and his commands, the commands of God. Throughout the centuries, the Roman pontiffs have declared that they stand in the place of God on earth. In his encyclical letter of June 20, 1894, so 125-plus years ago, Pope Leo XIII stated, We hold upon this earth the place of Almighty God. That's a fairly blatant statement, isn't it? Yep. But it's accepted all over the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Ferris Encyclopedia and Psych Ecclesiastical Dictionary adds, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. Okay, wow. So not only are we making human rules, we're making a human God. Mm -hmm. Continuing, the Apostle Paul adds these words exposing the power, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is God, or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians 2, 4. Okay. We now come to a serious but important point. Many of those who have been deceived by the devil's systems are honest and true to what they know. So we must be careful about talking about people in other religions. We've just already read, or just above there, where God is calling out my people, he says, he calls them out of these other systems. So it is not the people in the religions that may be misguided. It's the systems themselves that are misguiding the people. Yes. Okay. Should we say the leaders? Mm -hmm. You can call or them leaders. Even the, or is it even higher up than the, the leaders? It's the system. All the, all the way to the top. Um, uh, system. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Please. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just going to read the what? next section. So if you have something. But uh, the, the system could be the system we belong to. Now, just a minute, Charles. No, you, you, this you. is important. <laughs> no, really, truly, it is yeah. mighty, mighty important. We must turn our mm -hmm. eyes to the Lord and to Him alone. If the choice is between do we accept the Word of God or do we accept the guidance of a human being, no matter who that person is, That's then... That's important. Yep. We have to be careful that we're, shall I dare say, interpreting the Word yes. of God correctly. Yes. That we're looking at the right part and looking at enough right parts. And the mm -hmm. right translations. And putting it all together. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mrs. White says in Gospel Workers, it is true that we are commanded to cry aloud, spare not, Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. It's from Isaiah 58.1. This message must be given, but we, show, we should be careful not to thrust and crowd and condemn those who have not the light that we have. We should not go out of our way to make hard thrusts at Catholics. Among the Catholics, there are many who are the most conscientious Christians Amen. who walk in all the light that shines upon them, and God will work in their behalf. Those who have had great privileges and opportunities, but who have failed to improve their physical, mental, and moral powers, and have lived to please themselves, refusing to bear their responsibility, are in greater danger and in greater condemnation before God than those who are in error upon doctrinal points, yet who seek to live to do good to, to others. Wow. So I shouldn't feel smug? There's no room for feeling smug mm, here. No. I'm thinking of the young girl, I've mentioned her in this class before, who uh, she was asked, what's a saint? And she thought about the huge cathedral where she was used to worshiping and she would look up while she was listening to the sermon and see the light shining through, the figures are up there. And she says, well, a saint is someone that the light shines through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot more truth to that than she thought, <laughs> than she understood. 
We know that in ancient times, Babylon was represented in Daniel's prophecy by the head of gold, that's Daniel 2, and later by the lion in Daniel 7. Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians and was totally destroyed. Babylon's fall is described in Jeremiah 51, 50 and 51. We don't have time to read those, but we'll look at a bit of a summary here. Jeremiah 50 and 51 predict Babylon's destruction by the Medes and Persians. One of the reasons for Babylon, and that was written, of course, before it actually had happened. One of the reasons for Babylon's demise was its idolatry. The Babylonians believed that these images were representations of their deities. In Babylonian religion, the ritual care and worship of the statues of deities was considered sacred. The gods lived simultaneously in their statues and temples and the natural forces they embodied. So they believed that the god was inside that image, that statue. The pillage, the pillaging of dist or destruction of idols was considered to be a loss for the people of divine patronage. So if you destroy the idol, what happens? You've destroyed that god, he can't help you anymore. For example, the Chaldean prince, Marduk Apla-Idina II, lived into the, uh, fled into the southern marshes of Mesopotamia with the statues of Babylonians, Babylon's gods to save them from the armies of Sennacherib of Assyria. Wow, it's quite a thing. Quoted in our Bible study guide for Thursday. Look at what the ancient prophets said about Babylon. Jeremiah 51, 15, and 15, 16, and 19. Jim, can you get that for us? The Lord made the earth by his power, by his wisdom, he created the world and stretched out the heavens. At his command, the waters above the sky roar. He brings clouds from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning flash in the rain and sends the wind from excuse me, from his storeroom and God of Jacob is not like them he is the one who made everything and who has chosen Israel to be his very own people the Lord Almighty is his name okay so that's quite a distinction from these worthless things to God Almighty the one who created mm -hmm. Charles Exodus 20 can you do that for us sure Exodus 20, verse 4, Do not make for yourselves images of anything in heaven or on earth or in the water under the earth. Psalms 115, 4 to 8. Good. Their gods are made of silver and gold formed by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. And noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel and feet, but cannot walk. They cannot make a sound. May all who made them and who trust in them become like the idols they have made. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful presentation. I just hope I can be like that idol, right? Well, 2 Kings 17, 15 has something to comment about, something to comment about that. Go ahead. Me? Okay. They refused to obey his instructions. They did not keep the covenant he had made with their ancestors, and they disgraced, disregarded, disregarded his warnings. They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. Wow, there you go. That's what happens. They followed the customs of the surrounding nations, disobeying, disobeying the Lord's command not to imitate them. Must be talking about the Israelites who... Yes, this is talking, this is talking about the downfall of the northern kingdom of Israel. Israel, right. Yep, this is what they did. They went to the Mesopotamian people. Mm -hmm. and, wow. Are we a whole lot different? <laughs> now, Gordon... Hold on now. Were the Jews? A, were the, well, we're not. We're, at least we're not different. sacrificing our children on, on in the burning red hot uh, hands of a of an idol. Maybe we're doing it differently. Yeah. I hope not. Hmm. So, from the Bible study guide for Thursday. Though the issues of the idolatry of spiritual Babylon go deeper than just bowing before images of wood and stone. Spiritual Babylon does 
parallel ancient Babylon with the images introduced into its worship service. The use of images as objects of worship, or so-called veneration, is a violation of the second commandment because it limits the ability of the Holy Spirit to impress upon our minds the things of eternity and reduces the majesty of God to a lifeless statue. These images were introduced into Christianity in the fourth century to make Christianity more acceptable to the pagan populace. Unfortunately, these images are often given the sacredness and homage that belongs to God alone, which makes the whole thing spiritually degrading. Wow. Bible study guide for Thursday. Okay, so now we're starting to see what happened. So what happened in the fourth century? What? Well, uh... Uh, what's his name? Constantine. Constantine suddenly became a Christian. Well, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. His mother had become a Christian before that. And when he went, and so then when the, when the former um, emperor died, the former... Um, he was a, he was a uh, Roman, but they were all... There were, there were three Roman generals, each one of who wanted to be the next emperor. And as he was going out to, to fight against the other two, he looked up in the clouds and he thought he saw cross. a cross. And he said, I have to adopt my mother's religion. And he went out and he won the battle and he thought he took that to be a sign that God wanted him to adopt the Christian religion. So let's see what... political expediency. Yeah, it was political expediency. Let's, let's read. Well, from the Great Controversy, Mrs. White says, Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots, but her daughters must be symbolized. By her daughters. By her daughters symbolized churches that clung to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. The message of Revelation 14 announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to religious bodies that were once pure and have become corrupt. Since this mm. message follows the warning of the judgment, it must be given in the last days. Therefore, it cannot refer to the Roman Catholic Church alone, for that church has been fallen in a fallen condition for many centuries. Furthermore, in the 18th chapter of, Re of the Revelation, the people of God were called upon to come out of Babylon. According to this scripture, many of, the, many of God's people must still be in Babylon. And in what religious bodies are the greater part of the followers of Christ now to be found? Without a doubt, in the various churches professing the Protestant faith. Wow. So most of God's faithful people are still in those yes. Babylonish churches, okay? That's according to Ellen White in early 1900. Yeah. Um, at the time of their rise... These Is it still true? Yeah, I'm not Ellen White. You, you just keep <laughs> poking that stick. Uh, at the time of their rise, these churches were... These churches took a noble stand for God and the truth, and His blessing was with them. Even the unbelieving world, world was constrained to acknowledge the benefit, beneficence results that followed an acceptance of the principles of the gospel. In the words of the prophet to Israel, Thy renown went, renown, yeah. Yeah, their re, thy renown went forth, among the heathen for thy beauty. And it was perfect through my comeliness, hmm. which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. Let's, but, let's see if we can interpret that in modern yeah. language. What this means is that during the days, for example, the days of David and Solomon, when the people of Israel were, at least early days of Solomon, they were pretty faithfully following the truth. I mean, they, they were conquering all the nations around them, and those people were coming and worshiping together at the temple when Solomon dedicated the temple. Many, many people from other nations were coming there, and they were said, look at this great and wonderful and beautiful nation. So that's what it's talking about here. Okay, where did I go 
But they fell by the same. But they fell by the same desire, which was a curse and the ruin of Israel, the desire of imitating the practices and courting the friendship of the ungodly. Thou dost trust in thine own beauty and playest the harlot because of thy renown. Ezekiel 16, 14, and 15. Quoted in Great Controversy 382, 383. Just as Nebuchadnezzar threatened to destroy the Hebrew worthies in Daniel 3 uh, because they refused to bow down to his golden idol, so in modern times the second beast one of the associates of the devil himself declares a death sentence on God's faithful people. Listen to this very carefully. Revelation 13, 15. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. So now the second beast would be what group? I'd go to back to the reformers. Uh, uh, Apostate Protestantism. The second beast. Um, I thought it was a kingdom or a country that was coming to formation. Yes. It, it toward the so latter it's part the of apostate the Protestantism, but it's it's enforced so, by whom? Enforced by the United by States the United of America. States. In fact. Uh, reformers like uh, John Newton believed in early 1720s when Isaac he was alive. Huh? Isaac Newton. Was it Isaac? John. Isaac. Uh, John Isaac. Newton wrote the yeah. famous, uh, yeah, Isaac Newton, that uh, that second beast was not too far. Mm -hmm. And that was in the early 1700s that he talked about. And okay, so the second beast is giving authority to the United States. So let me interpret this as I understand it. Okay, you can disagree if you like. The second beast, Revelation 13, suggests that it is a political, civil, military organization. I would say it's the United States of America, which will one day support with force the decrees of apostate Protestantism, which in turn is supporting the decrees of whom? The first beast, the beast which we believe is the Roman Catholic Church. I've okay. Got to, I've got to make a comment in here very quickly. We, if we, if indeed we think we're looking in the future, what we're reading now, we're very mistaken. Very, very mistaken. It's happening now. It's happening now. Our mm -hmm. rights are going to be taken away. I was listening to Jay Sakulo. You probably know that name. Mm -hmm. I was com well, coming here. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm listening to digital currency has already been approved. When mm -hmm. that happens, a, a, Emilio Canicli used to say, we're all going to be surprised. And some are going to be surprised and ready. Many will be surprised and not be ready. We're living mm. in that time now. Yeah. Now, um, um, the, the, world will, yeah. Well, the well, World Economic Forum. Meeting right now. Yes, there you are. You know, we need to open up our eyes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and they're talking about the uh, environment, going bunkers. So we have to save the environment. How do we do it? through controlling Control. the economy. There you are. So it's really, truly really coming to head. Revelation 12 and 13 speak of three different beasts. One, the first red or scarlet covered beast represents the devil himself. Two, the second beast appears very similar to that beast, but is not red colored and represents the Roman Catholic Church system. Three, the third beast or image of the beast represents apostate Protestantism, those churches which are following the example of Roman Catholicism, but are still claiming to be Protestant, and they will be they will look to civil and military authorities to back up their claims. What do we know about these extra beasts, especially the second beast and its final outcome? Revelation chapter 14, 9 through 11. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on their forehead and on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur 
before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and his image for anyone who has the mark of its name. Okay, really quick question. Smoke, what does it consist of? Ash. Carbon. It's, it's, the, it's the dead out. results, the burned out results of something. Right. It's not living. It's not living at all. So just a note. In, so, right. And when we talk about God's wrath, we know from many studies that God's wrath is simply is turning away from people who don't want him anyway. They've already turned themselves to human authorities instead of God's authority. So he finally says, okay, if that's what you're determined to do, I have to let you go. In Exodus 20, with the Ten Commandments, in the Second Commandment, we are told that we are not to make for ourselves image of anything in heaven or on earth or in the waters under the earth. Look what the angel's, what the angel's explanation in Daniel 7.25 says about the future Babylon. You will speak against the supreme God and oppose God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. Good news, Bible. Okay, in Daniel's day, when Babylon was still a major force, see, Daniel 7 was written when Babylon was a ruling, ruled the world. He was predicting that a future Babylon would try to change religious laws and festivals. As we know, the Roman Catholic Church openly proclaims that it has the authority to change God's worship day on the Sabbath to Sunday. Does it seem almost unbelievable that we, would, we could be worshiping a Babylonian type system in our day? Mm. The real question is, will we do it our way, man's way, or God's way? Love versus selfishness. Creation versus evolution. Pope versus Christ. Notice the starting words, the startling words from Ellen White. Uh, is that mine? That's you, Mara. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false, false God as were the worshipers of Baal. That should make every one of us sit up they have and the shake wrong a conception mm -hmm. of God. If you don't understand, if you're not attempting to understand God and, and, and you have a misunderstanding, a false idea about it. Perhaps you think he, he's going to burn people forever in hell. Okay, that's a false conception of God. These two religious systems have some very important differences. Our Bible study guide says the first system is based on the Word of God with Jesus Christ at its center. The second system is based on human reasoning with human religious leaders at its center. The contrast is between truth and error. Salvation by grace, salvation by works. Obedience to God's commandments and submission to human decrees. From our Bible study guide. To those who know something of Christian history, for hundreds of years, Roman authorities refused to let people read the Bible for themselves. The church leaders were expected to read the Bible and interpret it according to the church's wishes and teach the people that form of things. So to repeat the basic core issues in these two contrasting systems, God's system is based on people's understanding the Word of God, which they have been able to read for themselves and understand it correctly, versus Babylon's dependence on human wisdom and on human leaders to ascertain divine truth. Do we see any of that kind of stuff going on in the world today? Nobody turns to human authorities, do they? Mm -hmm. yeah. When God's word is right out there? God's system tells us that we must worship him directly in person, not through saints, not even through Mary, as good as she was. The Babylonian system places idolatry at the center of its worship. We must never forget what Jesus said. Jim? John. Chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus answered them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me, from the Good News Bible. And then from the Bible study guide, Revelation 
12, verse 17. One of the principal passages in our study this week speaks of the remnant from the KJV, or the rest of her offspring from the New King JV. The concept of the remnant is found throughout Scripture. It is drawn especially from the Old Testament. There are three Hebrew words that are used for the remnant. Each of these words has its own shade of meaning. They can be literally translated as what escapes, those who escape, what remains, the remnant, to be left over or to remain, from the Bible study guide. Okay, so what would that say about the end time? What does that tell us? When you go, I remember in the days when my parents, my, my father was a student and and even that, shortly after that, we were relatively poor. And my, my mother was a great seamstress. And she would go down to these stores, these huge stores, I mean, the fabric, you know, things, rolls of fabric all over the place. And then she would say, okay, what pieces are, are left over? Odd pieces here and there. You could buy the remnants. That's what. So in terms of talking about God's faithful people and the religious systems that have, con you know, just overtaken the world, as we read earlier, what are the remnant? That the few means. people that are left, right? Revelation 12, 17, we've already looked at it once, but let's read it again. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the breast of her descendants. All those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. Who are the rest of her descendants? From the Bible commentary, FCA Bible commentary, the remnant of Old Testament times is thus composed of successive generations of Israelites, God's chosen people. Again and again, the majority apostatized, but each time there was a faithful remnant that became exclusive heirs to the sacred promises, privileges, and responsibilities of the covenant originally made with Abraham and confirmed at Sinai. This remnant was the formally appointed group in which God proposed to send the Messiah and through which he proposed to evangelize the heathen. It did not consist of scattered individuals as such, however faithful they might be, but was a corporate entity, God's visible, divinely commissioned organization on earth. Okay, now let's think are, about are, that. For are we trying to say that it's the the church that's going to go well, through the let's end? Let's just think about that for a moment. God started out with Adam and Eve. And what did he end up with? A flood. He started over with Noah. And what did he end up with? Tower of Babel. And then later, Abraham having to leave his, his family because even his family were worshiping idols and so forth. So he starts over with Abraham. And what does he end up with? bunch of slaves in Egypt, I mean, and he starts over basically with Moses. And what does he end up with? Two nations split apart that are fighting with each other, trying to kill each other and so forth. And finally, a remnant of that group that we, we call Jews today that, that crucified Jesus. That was their well, the choice. Romans, the Jew, but the Jews were, some of the Jews were in favor of it. Yeah, they were the ones responsible. It was the... Uh, and then he the starts over with the disciples. Yeah. And what happens? He ends up with a, an apostate church. Then he gets the Reformation. And what happens? And all, all through the whole history of what you described there, most of them are still pagan. Yeah think that they can do something to change God's mind. You give him stuff. God needs stuff. Sacrifices. <laughs> well, how stupid. But yeah. the last sentence that Gordon just read. Yeah. Uh, and you highlighted that as well. I think this is wishful thinking. Yeah. No, really, truly. Yeah. Does as this mean that God has failed multiple times? Well, our the, thing the, up here, the, the sequence that you went through there. Yeah, it does. It does. It means well, God's that, people have no, failed. No, no, but he, the organization failed again and again and again. But his people, how well, few they were. Yeah, they stayed faithful. 
Yeah. So there is a vast. I, I believe. I, I myself. I believe well, that the organized church is not going to last too long. Well, let's just let's so, just look at that. Just a, the classic example is how many did God manage to save at the time of the flood? Eight. Well, He eight. knew 120 years before before the flood came. How many? How big the boat needed to be? Yep. Hey. Eh? Yep. And when it comes to the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah or Sodom, He knew how many. People needed to be rescued because the others didn't want to, had no interest. Okay, as we draw closer to the end of time, Satan recruits two major religious forces to help him accomplish his goals. Revelation 13 talks about them. God's response in Revelation 14 clarifies what will happen. In Revelation 14, the first angel is followed by the second proclaiming, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath, the wrath of her fornication, Revelation 14, 8. This term Babylon is derived from Babel and signifies confusion. It is employed in the scripture to designate various forms of false or apostate religion. In Revelation 17, Babylon represents as a woman, a figure which is used in the Bible to symbol to as the symbol of the church, its vitreous a woman, virtuous. oh, virtuous woman, representing a pure church, a vile woman, the apostate church. Okay. Great controversy. So, we conclude that Jesus wins and Satan loses. So let us conclude here a contrast between Revelations two women. We have just a moment left. The pure woman in Revelation 12 is clothed with the sun. She is adorned with the glory of Christ's righteousness. The impure woman in Revelation 17 is dressed in purple and scarlet uh, garments. She is adorned with human falsehood and tradition. The pure woman has a garland of stars on her head. She is guided by the teachings of the apostles uh, in her mission. The impure woman is adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She depends on her lavish wealth and outward adorning to impress and attract her followers. The pure woman stands on the moon. She derives her power from their prophetic word. The impure woman sits on a scarlet beast, which we now know as the devil. She derives her power from the state or the political power of the earth. From our Bible study guide, page 120. And so there we see the contrast. We hope those have become clear to you. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a marvelous God you are, how privileged you are to see through the scriptures and through the writings of Ellen White, these truths presented so clearly. Help us not to be misled, misguided, to be deceived, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.